Welcome back to the Depth and Light podcast. I'm your host, J.D. Pirtle. Today we'll be talking to engineer and educator Sylvia Lebo Martinez. She's the author of Invent to Learn, Making, Tinkering, and Engineering in the Classroom, which has been called the Bible of the Maker Movement in Schools. Sylvia and I discuss the state of the art in maker education, and she offers advice on a variety of pedagogical issues educators face when teaching with technology, including her approaches on three of the biggest, time, space, and assessment. The term maker is being used a lot. Maker is heard frequently in popular culture and maker space even more frequently. I work in this world, so obviously I hear it a lot. But I wondered what the average person thinks when they hear the word maker. I asked several people, people who I guess don't use those two terms very much, what they think when they hear them. The general gist wasn't too far from the definition I'd give if I were asked. The word maker made them think of making things, or inventing things, or, my favorite, learning to do things yourself. If you don't work in education, at a summer camp, or have school-age kids, you may have no idea that a revolution to empower students through hands-on learning is underway in schools across the world. In preschool through 12th grade schools, the maker movement is manifesting itself in myriad ways. The resulting teaching environments vary as greatly as do the schools which house them. For some schools, it may mean that they built a wood shop or bought a 3D printer. Sometimes they happen just in one center of one classroom. But other times, it's a retrofitted library, an entire repurposed classroom, a cart, or vast innovation centers housing numerous specific-use sub-labs. These spaces feature tools like 3D printers, laser cutters, robots, woodworking tools, soldering irons, and even virtual reality suites. Some educators are writing curriculum for these spaces and serving kids as young as three years old. But regardless of how they're doing it, how to do it properly is anything but clear. There are tons of factors that make this work difficult, and teachers, school administrators, and parents have a lot of questions. As you might have guessed, educators have the most questions about this type of work. Questions like, what if the work goes against the tradition or perception of the school? When in the school day are we going to do this? What do we have to take out of the school day to accommodate this work? Who will teach it? How do all of these machines work? Who will fix them if they break? And, the biggest one might be, What if students realize I'm not an expert with any of this? If you went to school during or before the 1970s, or even during the early 80s, you probably remember taking wood shop or auto shop or home ec or industrial arts. I've heard people in their 50s or older talk about learning to tune a car or how to weld or use a lathe to turn a table leg or even to make a pie crust. But trust me, by the time I got to school, most of that was entirely gone. We spent a lot of time memorizing things and taking tests and prepping to take tests but we rarely made things. But today, a teacher with a maker mindset might ask students to make anything they want or invent a solution to a problem like not having easy access to a municipal water source or to demonstrate learning they did in some novel form rather than writing a paper or making a PowerPoint. The maker movement in schools has its origin in the overall maker movement. The maker movement is related to a few other paradigm shifts in culture. One example of this is the DIY or do-it-yourself movement. DIY represents a return to craft. Adherents of this movement seek to learn how to do things themselves. The maker movement, like the DIY movement with which it shares so many characteristics, is centered on experiential learning, or learning by doing. The movement focuses simultaneously on both the process and the product of this type of learning. As such, much emphasis is placed on how one is making and what one is making. While the maker movement often evokes visions of 3D printers, laser cutters, and robots, it can also refer to a very broad set of tools and processes from software engineering to embroidery. If all of this sounds like something you'd love to have in your school, or hope your own kid's school will have, you're not alone. But the future of this movement is anything but certain. This revolution in schools faces a lot of obstacles, time and space being the biggest ones. But there's another huge problem. Right now, there aren't a lot of opportunities for aspiring educators to learn how to teach with these tools in their undergrad, graduate, or PhD programs. And on top of all of this, if you're a school principal or a head of school, it's really hard to hire somebody who knows the tools, has experience teaching with them, and can create engaging projects that utilize them. So at this point, you might be asking yourself, why are schools focusing on this type of work when so many are struggling to keep arts and music programs funded? Why do schools need makerspaces when math scores have recently reached a 20-year low on the ACT? 
But what if the curriculum involving the types of tools and experiences made possible by the maker movement in schools could incorporate and extend arts and music? And what if teaching students to employ ways of thinking and doing commonly used by designers and engineers could actually improve test scores? Educators and researchers are asking themselves those questions and many more. And many of them are out there trying to help teachers navigate the uncertainty of this movement in schools. Sylvia Lebo Martinez is one of those people. Sylvia, I just want to say thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk to me. We're thrilled to have you. Well, thank you. I'm here, thrilled to be here. So I'm really curious. You started off your career as an electrical engineer. What precipitated the transition from that into um, the world of education? So I spent about 10 years in aerospace. I spent another, you know, even longer in, in video game design, which we can talk about. It isn't as strange a transition as you might think. But in all those different experiences, I really saw that um, the kinds of experiences that happen in the real world in engineering and science uh, aren't like what happens in school. And so I, I got more and more interested in thinking that through, why school so narrowly defines what success in science looks like. And, um, you know, when my kids are, were born, you look at them and they're like little learning machines. And it's like, this is not how school's working. So I kind of, I really got interested in learning and went back to school for an education degree and started working with schools and nonprofits and trying to bring real science and technology in, into schools. As of May 7th, I think, this year, it's been six years since you released Invent to Learn, the book you authored with Gary Steger, and people have called it the Bible of the maker movement in classrooms. What do you feel, I mean, six years later, what has the impact of Invent to Learn been on the education community? Six years ago, when we published the book, we really saw um, some really amazing things happening, precipitated by the maker movement. You know, new ways to make things, de de democratizing the process of invention. This global brain that was like jumping on problems and 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 sharing solutions and openness and 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 that those kinds of uh, things weren't being translated to schools. So we wanted to write the book to build a bridge between the maker movement and education, not to tell teachers what to do, but to ground the tools and technology and the sort of get her done mindset um, in good education pedagogy. Because we know how kids learn, and it's very much like what, what a maker does. You jump in, mm -hmm. you try things, you, you, you give it a go. And when kids have the opportunity to go deep into things that they care about in a community of people that care about them and care about the stuff that that you're all making together, um, I, I think it, it it really benefits us all. So we wrote that first book. You know, kind of nobody had heard of the maker movement in, in a lot of schools, but there were enough schools doing interesting things. We found examples and people uh, who were doing these fascinating things. We put them in the book. And we just released a second edition in January, updating some of the technology, but really we didn't, what we didn't need to update was the pedagogy. It's still true that we know how kids learn, that, that um, being deeply involved in something is a catalyst for making meaning in the world, in, in anything that you're interested in, any subject area. That's great. Yeah, I, I can't wait to take a look at the uh, second edition. Um, another thing you're involved with that I'm fascinated by is FabLearn, and you're the principal advisor to the FabLearn Fellows. Um, can you tell us more about FabLearn, like what it is and what it does? So FabLearn has a super interesting history. Um, it's it's out of the Fab Foundation run by Neil Gershenfeld and Sherry Lassiter at the MIT Center for Bits and Atoms, and um, they they have fab labs all over the world. Um, 1800, the last time I looked and like doubling, wow. like it's, it's exponential. Um, the fab lab idea was that communities could have a place where people could make anything to solve community problems. And this is, you know, it, it's right in step with this idea that the world wants to share problems and solutions and we're all better for it. Uh, the idea of the of Fab Learn was that there are specific issues and constraints and logistics that happen when you move a Fab Lab into a into a school. 
So uh, Fablern was started by Paolo Blickstein, who has a, a, a amazing constructionist pedagogy. He went to mm -hmm. Paulo Freire schools when he was growing up in Brazil. He studied with Seymour Papert at the MIT Media Lab, and he started this Fablern as a way for educators and uh, researchers and practitioners to come together as a way to disseminate research, as a convening. There are conferences. Um, and then the fellows are educators around the world who are doing this in, in their own schools. So I work to help them tell their stories, to put this out there so that everyone can say, well, this isn't really happening. There are real mm -hmm. schools, real people in the poorest countries in the world, in the richest schools, in, you know, in fancy neighborhoods, in, in big cities, all over the world, people want kids to be part of this revolution of making the world a better place. Um, yet another thing you're involved with. So I had the first time I met you and Gary was when I attended Constructing Modern Knowledge in 2014. And, you know, since then, I mean, I just kind of made the transition from higher ed to K through 12. And since then, I've, I've got to say, I've attended a lot of ed tech and education conferences. But Constructing Modern Knowledge is one of very few that I know of where teachers get a chance to roll their sleeves up and try it themselves. Why do you think that hands on experience is so important for educators? Oh, I, I, I think it's the only thing that matters. I, I think that educators have it within themselves to change. I think they're underestimated. I think that um, they, they have amazing ideas. And, and given the chance to work those things out in a, in a community that can say, hey, I've got you know, just the tool you need. And, the, and then their ideas become amplified. They go back to their classrooms um, thinking I can do anything, and that translates to what to, to what they can do with the kids that they that they work with. So, in a similar sense to what you said earlier about when kids are doing things themselves and the, and there's meaning where it's something they really care about, you feel like the teachers when they are doing something themselves, they're learning by doing, and they're doing something that they care about. It increases their kind of pedagogical approach and the effectiveness as an educator. Absolutely. You know, we we do take bring a lot of stuff. In fact, constructing modern knowledge. Uh, if you're listening to this podcast in in June 2019, uh, it's a month away. So we do this event in, in, in July in Manchester, New Hampshire, constructing modern knowledge dot com. Uh, we we really think that when when you know you have the feeling of what it feels like to learn. You, you remind yourself of, of, of what it feels like to be in those beginner shoes and, and think about constraints in a new way. You know, mm -hmm. every problem has constraints. Every school has constraints. But when you can kind of take a step back and say, can we change things? Are the problems we're having because we're constraining ourselves unnecessarily? Can we fix some of these things or all of these things? Um, mm -hmm. I, I think those kinds of, of sort of, you know, uh, times to let your mind go and to to do something you never expected you could do gives you perspective mm -hmm. on everything else. No, that makes total sense. Um, you know, as far as the maker world goes, it was interesting. Just I think last week, TechCrunch and Gizmodo have reported that Maker Media, um, the organization behind Make Magazine and two of the largest maker fairs in the United States, has ceased operations due to insolvency. Um, I mean, I think at this point, six years after Invent to Learn has been published, Maker has really become the convenient moniker for that popular movement in schools. Um, mm -hmm. But what do you see as the underlying principles behind this revolution in education? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry that Make Media is, you know, going through financial difficulties. It's tough. Um, they, you know, Maker Fair ran on corporate donations and corporations are kind of fickle. I mean, I'm not surprised that they jumped on a bandwagon and jump back off. Um, you know, it, 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 it's tough. And, um, but I think the maker movement is much bigger than make media. It will go on. Mm -hmm. Um, I hope that all the, the, the resources make magazine is fantastic. Um, I think they were starting to make, uh, some changes about the representation of women and people of color and non-Western kinds of, uh, of makers. Um, you know, so I, I hope all of that that lives somewhere as a resource. And, um, you know, I, I certainly, it, it was certainly a good thing that the make mm -hmm. brand came up at a time because I can tell you there'd be no hacker revolution in schools. 
make is a word that sounds safe and warm and who can be against making in it? It kind of fits into what schools were looking for as a way to push back against kids not having any hands-on experience and just sitting around, you know, doing test prep all the time. So it came along at the perfect time. Um, and, I, you know, we don't have to stop using the word. I think it's still a, it's still a great word. Um, but I always mm-hmm. try and explain that it's not just about touching things. You know, it's more than um, kids, you know, walking off to a room and print 3D printing a, a keychain every month because that kind of, of idea gives an excuse for the rest of school not to change. That sure. this idea that that um, kids can create things should pervade every minute of every day uh, because that's how you make meaning. That's how you understand yourself better. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's not because a few kids are going to get some great STEM job, right? Um, right. Uh, some are. That's great. But every student should have the opportunity to express themselves, to understand science and technology and education and history and paleontology and be those things today. You know, be an engineer today, not, you know, oh, in some far distant future, you're going to be an engineer. In the meantime, we'll read about engineers. How, that's not, you know, that's not alive. That's not a vibrant way to for 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 kids to, to start to love something. And sure. um, so I, I think, you know, the movement is bigger than, than make media um, and, and will go on. Speaking of schools and kind of like what, what happens in schools, when I'm working with schools, and I'm sure you you encounter this also, the three biggest areas of anxiety that I see um, when people are starting to incorporate emerging and traditional technology into curricula are time, space, and assessment. I wonder if we could go through each one of those and kind of get your best practices and advice for everyone out there. Um, How do you think schools should address time? Should it be a required coursework? Should it be electives, after school clubs, or all three, or something else? Yes. Yes, all three? (laughs) Yes, all 10. I mean, Uh, there's no magic formula. There's nobody's going to come up with the with the blueprints and the framework and the you know six key facts or you know it, it it's just going to be every community has to sort this out. The people mm-hmm. in the school have to embrace the change, and what the change is should depend on them. I I every person who writes about change says that the people who are responsible for the change have to be respond have to be the same people who are going to change it doesn't happen mm-hmm. any other way and you know one of the things we wrote in the second edition is that that we're never going to believe again that schools can't change we saw it all over the world people said this is going to happen and they made it happen it doesn't mean mm-hmm. it's easy it doesn't mean it happens overnight but when people care about it things change to the, to the point of time. Some people say, well, you can't do it in a 42-minute period. Well, you might want to change your 42-minute periods. Does that right. ripple into other things? Maybe. But if your problem is time, then you have to take a hard look at your schedule. Where can we carve out time? Where are we wasting time? Where are we not getting the best benefit for the, for the investment we're making in, in time? Mm-hmm. You know, the bell schedule isn't written in stone or it shouldn't be. So possibly going to like block scheduling or just being more creative with how they get these tools and these opportunities into the kids' hands. I think it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Um, It's impossible to just sit down and say, we're going to make a block schedule because, you know, because. I think that if you start to have more hands-on experiences, it's natural to say we need more time. And the things that the kids are making are worth more time. And then you have uh, the example, then you have you know, the reason to say, what if we do some team teaching? What if we rearrange? What if we do a, a lunchtime club? And what if the lunchtime mm-hmm. club we did last year evolves into something else, evolves into an independent study where kids can get credit? And you know, so, I don't, I never think that this is a, we sit down, we throw everything out and we start over. That's impossible. That's not going to happen. 
Well, so what about space? I hear a lot of, well, we don't have a room to make it into a maker space or we don't have room to store carts. Is it, do you have a similar philosophy as how to, how schools should use space? Absolutely. And I think that having the maker space is not always the best solution. Uh, you never want to give the impression that making happens in a special room, in a special time, in a special place. That creativity and innovation and using modern tools and technology and your brain should happen everywhere. So if it, how do we push making into every corner of the classroom? How do we revive the idea of student-centered curriculum, of centers, of uh, you know, of, of choice time where students have access to, to all of the tools. Now, look, I get it. Some things are expensive. Some things are dangerous. You don't want, you know, a, a, a flamethrowers in every classroom. That's, you know, mm -hmm. so somewhere in between there. I think people can do a lot of interesting things. I, I see schools doing carts. I see schools doing um, you know, a, a library loan kind of a program for tools and materials. Mm -hmm. You have to get creative. Maybe everyone doesn't build a robot in, Octo in October. It gets scattered over, you know, the whole year so that the materials you have can be shared from classroom to classroom. Um, you know, educators are creative people. They know their classrooms, their community, their school. They can make these decisions if they're given the, the authority uh, to, to do it. And I think that's where leadership comes in. So leaders are really need to be thinking about empowering the teachers to make these decisions, experiment, try something new with a new tool or a new unit with their students. A absolutely. And then not say, well, that didn't work back to the way it used to be, but, you know, be actively involved in, con in ongoing conversations about how to always make these, ch these changes stick and make them, uh, ex you know, expand campus wide. Sure. So the third area, and I think this may be the, the touchiest, I mean, some schools I see, and, and when I'm visiting schools, they've got kind of time and space figured out to their satisfaction, but then assessment becomes a really big um, stressor for them. And some schools just say, hey, this stuff can't be assessed. So it's just kind of an extra thing at the end of a unit or a lesson. Um, and some schools dive into assessment. What, but what do you think best practices for assessing this kind of work are? So there's like three chapters in Invent to Learn, uh, uh, not specifically about an assessment, but how you create classroom spaces that uh, where the projects are the assessment. So the, the things that the students are doing um, work or, or sometimes they don't work. You know, if I'm sewing a costume that has LEDs in it and the LEDs don't work, I don't need to hand it mm -hmm. to a teacher and wait a couple of weeks and get a, a, a D minus on it. You know, I know sure. right now the things you're working with are telling you that it doesn't work. And it, and that kind of, of um, idea also translates as a benefit for the teacher because the teacher isn't the bad guy who's going to, you know, judge you. The teacher is someone who can help you get your project, make your work better. So you, you reverse this sort of you know, us against them mentality into we're all working for these objects or for these things together. Now, I'm not saying it's all rainbows and unicorns, but, you know, you, you can choose um, assessment that interrupts the project process as little as possible. That um, mm -hmm. is, is something that, you know, classically, uh, you know, formative assessment that happens during the, the project process is not, I'm going to give you little mini quizzes every day to see where you are. It's looking at student work and saying, how's it going? Uh, what you doing? Uh, why'd you make that choice? Mm -hmm. And as a as an onlooker, if, if you're watching someone make something, you're certainly seeing a more interesting project and a more whole view of who that child is than waiting for, for a test. Um, so I think assessment needs to be rethought, especially in science and mathematics. I think mm -hmm. that we can learn a lot from teachers who do assessment all the time of things that are very subjective. You read essays, you listen to music, you watch students put on a play, and somehow those teachers figure it out. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's definitely something people bring up all the time, but something that there's a lot of answers in literature and a lot of experience with teachers already, it just needs to be reframed. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I think it's what's coming up in a lot of conversations I have is kind of 
just how humanities are being left out of STEM and STEAM. And it sounds like what you're saying is that the humanities teachers um, have been doing this kind of work. They've been assessing creative projects that seem nebulous, but really aren't. And we could, we could learn a lot from them. So the other part of this is I think we're in an R&D phase. You know, hey, I heard of the maker movement and now I'm supposed to know what kids, you know, micro bit projects look like magically. Well, how do I know what fourth graders can do with a micro bit unless I've seen a lot of fourth grade micro bit projects? So I think mm -hmm. that the idea of R&D is very important for schools who want to be on this, who want to try new things. Let's just forget about the assessment. You know, what the heck? One thing, a, a, a couple of projects. Is it is it going to, like, kill us to just watch what kids do and encourage them to do their best work and see what happens? And then, hey, let's talk about assessment after a year goes by, and then we'll revisit it as, as time goes on. Sure. So kind of the message there is kind of let's all relax a little bit and experience this. So it's experiential learning. So why not take some time to see how this works, to see how we as educators feel about it and what we want to do, what the kids are really into, what is challenging for them, what's successful for them, and not just rush to putting it on the report card as fast as possible. Look, I, I'm not going to diminish the, the um, pressure that teachers feel. Sure. To, to justify things that that is not my my message at all uh, you can't just relax when your job is on the line um, and I don't think that teachers should have to be martyrs to you know promote good learning for students so um, you know I would never I would never say that uh, you know oh here's what you should do and this is the answer that's 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 not not where I'm coming from so a fourth area, I think, um, if we had to list a fourth area after time, space, and assessment, it's acquisition. Like what software, what tools to buy? I mean, a lot of people feel like we have to have a 3D printer. We have to have a laser cutter. Um, what do you, how do you coach people when they're, I mean, they've got the space or they've got the ideas about what they want to do. What's, what's best practices for just starting to get equipment and different opportunities for kids? So I, I think the idea of a low threshold, high ceiling is very important. Um, what can what can beginners do? Whether it's software, hardware, the combination of both. What can beginners do? How do we get them using and making things quickly? And then how far can you go? If you mm -hmm. buy something and it's just a toy, you know, if the robot's doing all the work, what are kids learning? How do they program it themselves? How do they combine it with other tools and technology? Um, I would say that that's not the optimum place to put your money. Um, you know, the, the other part is curation, you know, buy less stuff, use it more. When the kids get better at, at it, if they need to go to the next level, you know, if you're using Tinkercad to make it with your 3D printer and you have a few students bumping up, up against the top level of Tinkercad, well, then they're, they should be able to articulate what they want to do. And in that articulation, you can say, okay, we're going to go to, you know, uh, SketchUp or, or, or some, you know, more powerful tool. If the students mm -hmm. are driving that, that step up, then th it's out of their need rather than just you saying, okay, Tinkercad is third grade and SketchUp is fourth grade and Fusion 360 is fifth grade because these kids are going to use Fusion 360 when they become, you know, designers in, in 10 years. And it's like, no, no, they should use whatever tool is the right, is the right tool. Now, how do teachers figure all this out? I think you start with with one thing and, and, and you use it. You use it with the kids. Modeling mm -hmm. that sort of, if I don't know how to do it, we're going to figure it out together, is a great thing for, for students to see. And, and I know teachers sometimes feel uncomfortable with that, like they have to have all the answers. But mm -hmm. with, with, with new things that are appearing in the world, nobody has all the answers. That's kind of the, the fun part, the beauty of the maker movement. So kind of changing gears a little bit. When I'm working with schools, I feel like, I guess the conversation revolves around technology a lot of times, but I'm increasingly thinking what we're really doing is building literacy and confidence with design. How, do, how important do you think design is in the maker world in schools? Oh, I, I think that's what people mean when they talk about STEAM. You know, I think people, uh, it's a better word than, you know, than the A made it a nice, you know, word, but um, it's not, it's not art as in decoration. Like we're going to decorate mm -hmm. our, you know, scientific uh, inquiry worksheet or, 
you know, the, the idea that, that the art is about aesthetics, it's about design, it's about making choices that are meaningful to you, I think is everything. You know, I mm -hmm. also think schools don't understand engineering and how tightly tied engineering is to design. Um, a lot of schools are very adept at the scientific method. You know, we have the the seven steps or the six steps and we have a worksheet and we do, you know, cross word search puzzles and we sing songs and, you know, mm -hmm. we, we walk kids through the scientific method, but the scientific method is a testing process. It doesn't work for invention. Um, engineering is, is a, is a design process. And when you're making new things, you're, you're taking the ideas out of your head and you're making them real in the world. And the process mm -hmm. of engineering is making those ideas work. And in making them work, you have to deal with all sorts of real world constraints. You know, there's never enough time. There's never enough money. If you're, you know, you have to worry about gravity. You, you know, there's always something that you're dealing with. And when you make things work, the natural thing is to then want to make them work better. So mm -hmm. I think it's a very natural process of, um, you know, we in in our book we call it TMI think make improve um, mm -hmm. and it's, and it is a kind of a joke because we we don't want it to be too much information we want it mm -hmm. to be about kids doing real work well, I, I think about this a lot since I'm you know I was a child in the 80s and a lot of things that like for example programming in logo was very common when I was a kid and then it kind of disappeared in a lot of ways the maker movement kind of traces back to Seymour Papert and his constructionist theory of learning and, you know, his groundbreak, groundbreaking work like uh, Mindstorms. But mm -hmm. I feel like that kind of left school for a while. But why do you think these ideas have taken so long to take hold again in schools? Well, I think in a lot of schools they didn't leave. Um, I think that, you know, people called them different names. Um, I think that the, the, the desire to, to, to be creative is, is really innate in people. And there was a time when schools move from using computers to do programming and to create things into using computers as a way for kids to take notes or take tests. And, and we called it technology and we mm -hmm. said, oh, this is the future and kids love to click on stuff. It's so engaging. It's so empowering. But, you know, I think people gradually came to realize that technology, that, that kids are engaged by doing things that are meaningful. They, they are empowered by doing powerful things in communities that care about them. And when you, when you get down to basics, when you say, what kinds of schools do we want? It's not a school full of test taking. It's a school full of kids who are excited about showing up and teachers who can't wait to, you know, explore new worlds with, the, with their students. And those, you know, if that's a trend, that's a, that's a good thing. I don't think it ever mm -hmm. went away. It's become easier to do it now. Back in the mm -hmm. 80s, you know, when you had a personal computer, you couldn't like see the guts. It, you sort of had to buy one ready-made. And sometimes you could make it yourself, but it was very expensive. The things we have available today, uh, like micro bits and, and an Arduino to some extent sort of paved the way for this, um, for kids to sort of get down to the bottom level and really know what's happening in the guts of, of the computer, this incredibly powerful device, uh, I, I think is is making that come back. And with with the ability to use the tools, the ideas are, are getting more, um, you know, more airtime, maybe. Sure. Um, another thing that I think about a lot and I, I know that people are struggling with a lot is kind of diversity and equity and inclusion in STEM and STEAM and in maker spaces and in technology and schools. What do you think some of the approaches that you notice people are, are using that are effective or what are some approaches that you coach people to use to kind of mitigate those issues? Well, I think anytime you talk about inclusion, you're, you're talking both about making uh, making tools and technology and the spaces accessible for every people uh, every person sometimes that's physical ac accessibility sometimes it's also like you know how the space appears to others if your tech lab is it is at the long uh, you know down a long dark hall and there's a closed door and when you open it there's like you know uh it doesn't look friendly it doesn't look like a place where i'd want to be I'd say mm -hmm. that's as much a barrier as anything else. So I think, you know, teachers have a responsibility to step back, look at their spaces. And if you don't really get a vibe, ask some kids, 
ask different kinds of kids, what does this space say to you? And if, you know, mm -hmm. if people come up to say to you and go, I wouldn't step foot in there if my life depended on it, you better figure out why and change it. Mm -hmm. You know, by the same token, the things you do in the space and show the community that you're doing in the space should, should be important to the community. And every community is different. The community on the outside, the community on the inside, uh, what do kids want to make? How can they make their school a better place, their community a better place, the world a better place? And that attracts people who aren't the sort of traditional, you know, kids who are good and getting good grades in math and science. It attracts all kinds of, of people. And those kinds of ideas should be welcome at all times. Um, and, you, you know, you have to think about it overtly. You can't just say, well, these are the kids who show up. What can I do about it? Um, you know, people go out and recruit. Uh, people mm -hmm. recruit like high schools recruit down to middle schools and say, you know, I, tell tell my tell the the guidance counselors, it's okay, girls should be in this class, or you know, it's for everyone. It's not just for kids who are going to college. Um, you have to do it in every way you can think of. When I first transitioned into K through twelve schools, I, I at first I thought the students are just so afraid of failure. But then after a few years of working with both, kind of 50% of my time was working with students, 50% was with teachers, I realized that really the teachers are the ones that are so afraid of failure. So how do we kind of get past that in schools? How do we, what do you coach teachers to do to kind of get past of this fear of failure so they can do some experimentation and iteration? A failure is not a word I love, I have to say. I think, you know, it means a very specific things in school. And certainly we can talk to kids and say, you know, fail early, fail often, and it's great, you know, work through mm -hmm. failure. But for some kids, they don't have the bandwidth to fail. They're, they're in a precarious situation where that just sounds like a trick. You know, right. fail, you know, go ahead and fail unless I give you an F. You know, that's, that's, that's not a position that, that kids can just sort of brush off. And so I think there are perfectly good words to talk about challenges. You, you, you know, you work around problems, you overcome challenges, you, 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 you do your best. You, sometimes you give up on things that aren't working. You, you take, you take a different road, you back up and look at your work. There are a lot of ways to express that, that I think are better than failure. Um, and you know, who, who wants to fail, especially when school teaches you that it's a super bad thing. And the, mm -hmm. the students who, who are the most adept at getting good grades are the ones who, who understand the system of school. And they're not going to be tricked by, by one teacher one day saying, hey, this doesn't count. Oh, sure. We mm -hmm. know everything counts, you know. And so I think it takes time. It takes a sure. consistent voice and a consistent culture. I think it, it means looking kids in the eye and saying, sometimes things are for a grade and sometimes they aren't. And here's the difference of being super honest about that. Um, and, you know, maybe everything doesn't have to be for a grade. Maybe we need to, to, to you know, <laughs> to, to, to reorganize some of school to, to, so that everything isn't this high stakes, you know, race to the top. Um, the good news is I think we've taught it to students. Mm -hmm. They've learned. So we can, we can unteach. You know, we can do something different. And kids will learn that over time there are different ways to, to succeed in, in this thing we call school. So maybe, in, in not, obviously not using the word failure in schools, but maybe just the way we talk about um, the need to experiment, that things aren't going to be perfect the first time necessarily. There's going to be setbacks and roadblocks, especially yeah. when we're using tools that we're unfamiliar with. So really, it's about the way we talk about it culturally, maybe in schools that can help us. Yeah, change absolutely. That fear. And, yeah. and look, I, I'm not trying to be the language police. You know, it's not like the you know we're going to rush to break down the door and tackle a teacher who's like you know saying failure. It's not. It's not a big deal. Plus, when you apply the language to your own self, if a kid walks up and goes, "Aha, uh -huh, epic fail," that's them. Right. That's not mm -hmm. someone else judging your work. I think there's a there's an important distinction. Yeah. And I mean, I think a, another thing I think about a lot that's a barrier to this type of work. And I hope that it's kind of going away over time. But I noticed that teachers are afraid to say I don't know out loud to their students. And when they're working with a new tool, for example, when I'm mentoring people who are 
teaching with Minecraft for the first time. I feel like the kids, especially like fourth, fifth grade, they're always going to know more about Minecraft than the teacher. So how do you coach teachers to be okay with not being, you know, I think they call it the sage on the stage, like saying, I don't know out loud to their students and kind of learning together. You know, part of this, I think, is, is, is if it happens in professional development, is modeling it. You know, at Constructing Modern Knowledge, you were there. <laughs> Gary and I weren't saying, oh, we know all about this. No, we were like, have an idea. Start to work on your idea. If you, if you have questions, we'll try and figure out what works. We don't know what half the stuff is. Uh, we just buy new things sometimes and bring them to, to CMK. And then people do the craziest things with them. H how sure. limiting would it be to say that I know everything, especially in the world today? Now, maybe, you know, back in some mythical time when the library held every book that contained all knowledge of the world, this was true. But not today. I mean, this is there's things happening all over the place. I, I use I use Google so much it's kind of it's kind of horrifying like everything mm -hmm. I don't know I just type it into Google why would you not uh, use the resources around you to figure out to figure out a problem sure and it seems like a lot of people are saying okay you have this thing in your pocket you have this thing on your desk that is like the greatest library that's ever created um, full of factual and sometimes not factual information but a lot of people are talking about now that really what we need to be teaching kids is how to synthesize new information, create knowledge from this wealth of data that they have at their fingertips, and um, that we really should be asking teachers to do the same thing. I, I completely agree. I think the role of the teacher is so crucial. I think a lot of people misunderstand the maker movement in schools as being like, oh, you dump out a bunch of cool technology and you step back and magic happens and it's like mm -hmm. no that's magic is not going to happen the 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 teacher's role as uh, of someone who understands the bigger picture and look if an if a arduino is blue one day and red the next day oh, it doesn't matter you sort of have the idea the big idea of what these things could do and mm -hmm. um you know and that's where you start it, it, and i think that the idea of curating interesting materials, of coming up with prompts. That's, you know, another thing in Invent to Learn, there's, there's, there's a chapter on setting prompts for, for interesting projects, prompts that mm -hmm. are, are simple and to the point and help direct students towards something that's going to then uh, generate the next idea. You know, if you make a musical instrument, can you make it, can you then write music for it? If you, can you play music with other people, this idea, and, and Gary's been um, thinking, reading and speaking and writing on this a lot. Gary Steger, my co-author of Invent to Learn, this idea mm -hmm. of generative as being even more important than iterative. Interesting, yeah. Well, Sylvia, uh, I just want to say again, thank you so much for your time. I'm wondering where can people find you online on social media, places like that? Oh, yeah. So online. So I'm on Twitter, S. Martinez. Um, I, I have a, a personal website, Sylvia, SylviaMartinez.com. The book, Invent to Learn, has its own website where all mm -hmm. of the resources that we talk about are, are uh, on InventToLearn.com, including all the handouts we use for our workshops uh, that Gary and I do all, all over the world. Uh, we have our shopping lists of, of, mm -hmm. of recommended materials. And then um, we also have a publishing company, which I'm, I'm happy to get a mention in, called Constructing Modern Knowledge Press, which we, we've published now 12 books, almost all of them by educators who are mm -hmm. working and doing this making in real schools where they share their best projects, great ideas, their secrets. Our latest book is an absolutely beautiful book called The Art of Digital Fabrication uh, by Erin Riley, where oh, yeah. uh, she talks about the integration of art and, and, and STEAM and shows projects that she does in her K-12 school. Excellent. Yeah, Erin was on my team at Constructing Modern Knowledge. We made a well, there you go. interactive makey makey jungle. Uh, so it's a small world. Um, I remember well, that project. And that's cmkpress.com. Yeah, so I'll definitely put all of those links in the show notes. And Sylvia, I just want to say it was a pleasure talking to you today. And it was a lot of fun. Well, thank you. I, I, I appreciate your time and good luck on all your future podcasts. Thanks for listening to the Depth and Light podcast. I'd like to say thanks again to Sylvia Martinez. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. 
For info about what we're up to, check out our website at depthandlight.com. That's D-E-P-T-H-A-N-D-L-I-G-H-T.com. Or follow us on Twitter or Instagram at the handle at depthandlight.